Good morning, church. It's good to be with you guys today. And I do want to make one extra plug because I, I know it's in the bulletin, but we are uh, we moved up the, the, our viewing of the chosen from the first week to the fifth week uh, due to how busy next Sunday's going or two Sundays next Sunday's going to be. So uh, make sure you're here tonight, uh, six o'clock. Uh, I'm going to order a few pizzas probably. So if you want to throw a couple dollars at me, that's great. Um, but, huh? What what number of the chosen? I think it's episode. So first week we watched one, second week it's number five. So we'll be watching episode five of the chosen. Uh, so season one, we'll be watching episode five. Uh, if you if you're coming and you want some pizza, let me know just so I know kind of how much to order uh, this evening. Uh, but I look forward to uh, seeing you guys who, who I know we have a, a group about 12 to 20 that, that come about every week. I know some people are out of town. Uh, if you haven't joined us on Sunday evening before, you should come. It's a great time that we can come together um, as a family. Uh, watch a show that is a beautiful depiction of what we read in the Bible plus kind of fleshing out the world a little bit more to kind of make it feel a little bit more lived in, add a little bit more reality to what we know is true but it's sometimes hard to really see in the 2D nature of kind of what we see on the pages sometimes. So it's, it's a great thing to, to watch for, for both entertainment, it's uplifting, plus it's fun to talk about it afterwards, uh, to share our thoughts about what we saw and, and where we thought they made some of those decisions and, and whether it was maybe adding to um, it being a good thing or maybe they, it detracted away a little bit. So just interacting with the story as we compare it to the gospel that we know to be true. Uh, but I do hope that you make that a part of your evening here today. Uh, so last week, uh, I challenged you to look back, to look back at the Levitical laws of sacrifice, uh, to try to appreciate the width and the breadth by which God's people were called into relationship with Him, uh, to remind you of all of the, the monetary and the spiritual costs that were associated with those sacrifices and how these sacrifices acted as a declaration of faith for the people of Israel. A declaration of their faith and their trust in the Lord. Now, the laws and the standards of these sacrifices did not disappear with the coming of the Messiah. Actually, in in Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 18, Jesus makes it pretty clear. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. This concept to fulfill them comes from this Greek word, pleuroa, no, rao, there it is, pleurao, uh, which means to fill to capacity. It's not just a, a check mark. It's not just... Um, I'm doing some of it, I, I, I'm, I'm doing what the law says. It is fulfilling that part of the law to its capacity, completely, utterly. The requirement of the law was to continue until everything is accomplished. Now that law, that law was given to God's people so that they would help, it would help them understand the difference between worldliness and holiness. It gave them a route by which, while they were living here on this earth, they could make that transition from worldliness to holiness. They could delineate and understand the difference between that worldliness and holiness. But it required constant sacrifice. It required constant acts of of sanctification. Anytime they became unclean because um, they touched something dead or they, they... failed in any measure of of these Levitical laws, they had to go through a cleansing process before they were seen or before they were worthy again to then make those sacrifices. The law was given so that they would understand the difference. And by that law, those who rejected God, who rejected relationship with Him, faced the consequences of that decision. They became subject to the justice of God. God's righteous justice is promised for all, especially even for the unrighteous. God's standards are incredibly high when it comes to holiness, as they should be. 
Isaiah 13, 11 says, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. Ezekiel 18, 20 says, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. In Genesis 6, 5 through 7, it talks about how the wickedness of man grieved God. It grieved God to the point that he was sorry to have made them. And in Isaiah 59, 1 through 2, he says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but, but your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. God's standards are as they should be, because God is perfect. Our unholiness. Our sin separates us from God and His love. And as we spoke about last month, this sin is is, is that wall that we have chosen to build up between ourselves and God. That sin is the wall that we built, even though we claim God to be our Lord. When we continue to follow our old master of sin, we're building up that wall. We We are forcing God to turn away from us. It was by our own will that we chose to be separated from His love and His mercy. Thank goodness, though, that God's mercy triumphs. When humanity rejected God and turned to their own sinful desires and will, God didn't just cast us aside. He mourned the loss of us. Because God is jealous for our attention, He was frustrated when our loyalties were so easily split between Him and ourselves and our own worldly desires. But though it would have been within his right as a creator of humanity and the world and everything in it to just destroy us, he chose mercy instead. 2 Peter chapter 3, it talks about how God is not like slow to bring this new heaven and new earth. He is patient with us. The word patient there is long-suffering. And if you've ever had children or you've ever been in a relationship or if you've ever had a sibling of some sort, You know what it is to be long-suffering. Long-suffering their nonsense. Their, their, Their toxic hatred towards you sometimes. And God is that way. He is long-suffering of us because He desires all to return to Him. God chose mercy instead of His judgment because despite all that we have done, And all that we had failed to do, God loves. Not past tense, not that he loved at one time. Despite all that we do, all that we did before, all that we continue to do, God loves us. In James chapter 2, he describes uh, one of the shortcomings of the law. And one of the biggest shortcomings of the law is that if you fail in one point of the law, you fail in all of it. To overcome this shortcoming, he urges his readers, he says, speak and act as those, who are, as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been mercy, merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. God's justice is perfect. His righteousness is perfect, because God is faithful. That's something that Brad has said um, in, in some meetings that we've had and conversations that we had, that, that God is faithful. He says, if you do this, you will die. But he gave us a way out of that. Though, though Christ did not abolish God's standard of what it means to be holy, his sacrifice simply did what other sacrifices could not do. It paid for all of the sin, all of the debt, once and for all. He gave us access to being holy again. In Romans 5, 12 through 21, Paul describes this beautiful symmetry of Christ's sacrifice. 
says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more? Will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in the condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as though the disobedience of the one man and the many were made sinners, So also the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass may increase, but where sin increases, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through the righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The curse of death entered the world through one man's sinful act. That same curse was removed through the act of Christ, that one perfect righteous act. Christ's death gave us a chance for eternal life again. The debt he paid belongs to each of us. Now, this debt was not simply erased and forgotten, because if that were so, then God would not be just. But instead, it was paid in full. He died so that we wouldn't have to suffer being separated from God for eternity. Through His sacrifice, our account was paid off, wiped clean once and for all. Not just forgotten, but paid in full. In Hebrews chapter 9, the Hebrew writer starts by describing the old requirements of worship and how they were not the culmination of worship, of our worship in relationship to, to God, but rather were a placeholder. He refers to it as a placeholder until the time of the new order. In verse 11, he shows how Christ inaugurated this new order, that that Christ is the new high priest, presenting a better offering in a more perfect tabernacle, not made by human hands. In verse 13, he talks about how at one time these earthly sacrifices were made to ceremonially make the unclean clean. And in verse 14, he shows that what was symbolically done through these old sacrifices, through these old process that we find in Leviticus, these old sacrificial acts of worship, God did for real through a new, perfect sacrifice of His Son. Sometimes I think we get this confused. Um, we, we, we think that God is kind of like figuring out as He goes. That, that he started in the garden, then man messed up, so he's like, okay, well, let's try something new. Here's some rules. Uh, follow these rules. And then we mess it up, and he's like, okay, so we, the humans messed it up again. Okay, we're going to change this again to, 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 to see if I can make it where that, that, that humanity can be in relationship with me. That God changes the script because humanity keep flaw, being flawed. That Jesus was just plan 2.0 or 3.0. And that a sacrifice was a reflection or an adaptation of the sacrifices that he, he instilled in the first place through Mosaic law. But that's not really the case. These old sacrifices, these old sacrifices made by human hands in temples made by human hands were just actually a poor reflection, a placeholder for what was always going to come. They were a poor reflection of the perfect high priest that Christ would become, the one who would act as both mediator and sacrifice, 
who would enter into a greater tabernacle not made by human hands, and whose sacrifice was done once and for all. The tradition of sacrifices instituted through Mosaic law that we find in Deuteronomy and in Leviticus and spelled out throughout uh, the time of Israel, those things were put there so that when Jesus was sacrificed, we would have a better understanding of it. Jesus' sacrifice was always the end game for God. It was not just the option God chose It was the only option. It was always the only end game that God had. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says that the the, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices, repeatedly repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. Verse 3 says, But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came to this world, He said, Sacrifices and offerings you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here am I. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O my God. First He said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He set aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus once and for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which he can never take away sins with. But when this priest has offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, He sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstools. For by one sacrifice he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies about this. First he says, this is the covenant, and I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write write my laws on their minds. And then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Before Christ came, the sacrifices had to be constant. Had to be repeated time after time, sin after sin. And not just the sins that that they knew of. Remember, there were even sacrifices that were required for sins that we didn't even know that we committed. The unintentional or unknown sins. Those sacrifices were insufficient when it came to being able to fully cleanse us of our sins. But they were that constant reminder. This constant reminder that, that humanity was flawed and faithless failure, always. It was not successful in discouraging our addiction to sin either. Because even though they would pay the cost, they would raise the lamb, they would put it up there to be sacrificed, they would still go back to their old master again and again. But remember, the main purpose of sacrifice was not to be punitive, but rather to be transformative. And because of that, God had to do something to ensure that it was transformative by choosing to become the sacrifice through Jesus. Choosing to become that perfect lamb, that perfect proxy for all humanity. Now, I've said this a few times in the last couple months. I don't think it was a fair trade. I don't think it was a good deal on God's choice, God's behalf. I I think he made a very raw deal. Because even if all humanity from the time Jesus was sacrificed on that cross, died, buried, and was resurrected, even if every single human being from that point until now had given their life to 
to, to serving God, I don't even think that would have been worth it. Worth God submitting himself to pain and death. It wouldn't have been worth it because God is so great. The fact that he had to take on any sin, in, in, again, in my opinion, wouldn't be worth it. But that wasn't the deal he made. It wasn't to assure that all humanity would instantly become perfect. It was just to give us a chance to make the choice to follow him. The chance, the opportunity to be worthy enough to be, to be called holy if we choose to follow him. But God decided that we were worthy. And by making that decision, by deciding that we were worth it, even if it was just the chance to be with Him in heaven, He then gave us worth. He made us worth by, dispo- by bestowing on us that worth. Each week we take time during our worship to remind ourselves of that sacrifice Jesus made. That sacrifice that he made on behalf of us, that broke us out of that that cycle of sacrifice. It was through his death that our salvation was assured, freeing us from the perpetual need for sacrifices and giving us the gift and access to repentance, being able to call out to God and say, God, I messed up again. Forgive me. And that with a contrite heart, if we, we, we truly repent, that He gives us salvation again. We don't have to go and make sacrifices again. We don't have to go and get baptized again to rewash off the sin because all of those sins are already forgiven. We just have to make the choice to be faithful, to strive to be holy. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 He writes, if we confess our sins, He is faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, this isn't to say that that by putting on Christ, we become immune to sin. We all know that that's not true. And if we just take a couple seconds to think about it, we could probably think of a few things that we did even on the way into church today that we need to be forgiven of. Instead, we have a greater responsibility, a greater responsibility to be faithful to the gospel that we profess, to live a life that reflects the love and the mercy and the forgiveness of God has already given to us. In Hebrews 10, 26 through 31, uh, he writes, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone who deserves to be punished, who has trampled the name of the Son of God underfoot, who has treated it as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge His people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The freedom that we have in Christ does not give us a license to be proud of our flaws and our failures. We must strive towards the standard of Christ every day, every moment. Strive to live holy, unblemished, and to trust that God will, in His mercy, will make up for all of our failures along the way. We must continue to strive towards that faith that we profess. Nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus became the sacrifice that he was always meant to be. It was the plan from the beginning. The only way, it was the only way that we could ever attain holiness. His sacrifice, once and for all, freed us from our sins. He opened the door to a true relationship with God. The question is, have you taken him up on that offer? Or are you still holding on to your sin? Are you trying to find another way to gain righteousness on your own, whether through through just acts of kindness and goodness in the world? Are you trying to, to earn it? Or are you doing those things in celebration of what has already been given to you
by His grace. If you are holding on to your sin, whether it's just holding on to the shame and not wanting to share it with others and just trying to, to, trying to deal with it on your own by, well, I'm, I'm going to go and do good things so that maybe, maybe I can earn my forgiveness. Let go of it. Stop. There's no point in following that path any further. Break the cycle of sin by embracing the sacrifice that Christ has made on your behalf. Accept that salvation. Accept the forgiveness and redemption that He has already offered to you and He's already paid for. There's no reason to hold on to it. There's no reason to think that you have to keep paying this sacrifice over and over again. It's time to leave the cycle of sacrifice and join in the, sac- the, sacle, the cycle of celebration of what was given for you. When you go out into this world, make sure that the words that you say and the things that you do reflect Jesus. That's what we're here for. Our job is to spread the gospel, to let people know the hope that we profess, and to celebrate it. And if you don't know how to do that, sometimes neither do I. So let's get together and let's talk about it. Let's find ways that we can live out our faith for real each day. Not just talk about it in practice or in theory, but to do it, to live our faith. We might as well start that today. Let's pray. Generally, Father God, we thank you. We thank you for giving your son coming down into this earth, reminding us once more what you cherish and what you desire, and then becoming the sacrifice that paid for all of our sins, both past and present and future. Lord, help us to take hold of that. Help us to celebrate that. And when we fail and falter along the way, help us to, to come to you and confess And to seek out ways that we can live and act better in your world. Knowing that you do forgive us. Lord, as we we go out into this world, help us to shine for you. Help us to cast off everything that defines us that, that isn't you. And let us celebrate the sacrifice that you made by living for you each day. In your name we pray.